you guys are all going to have to click like OK or something like that. So if you don't know Hoon, Hoon is a structural engineer with over 10 years of experience and recently became a multifamily investor. He is familiar with building construction systems and is experienced with managing renovation projects. Hoon enjoys networking and learning from other multifamily investors. Guys, and if you hop on a call with him, he's the kind of guy that you got to really ask questions to because he is, he's a chill, just laid back dude. So ask him a million questions and he'll have the greatest answers. Hoon, welcome. Thanks, Nico. Hi guys. Um, yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Nico and Josep, thanks for inviting me to be here at, at this uh, meetup. And um, uh, so hi everybody. To those of you who don't know me, um, like Nico said, I'm a structural engineer by trade and I've been doing this for about 10 years now. And um, about a year and a half ago, I started getting to multifamily and it's been a, a really good, really good journey so far. Um, so today, Nico Yosef have asked me to um, have a, a talk about a high level overview of underwriting and, and talk about equity split. Um, and yeah, I'm hoping that it'll be, it'll be helpful to some of you to see things from the perspective of somebody who, um, who just started not too long ago. Um, so yeah, let me uh, share my screen. Right, great. Again, um, this is two part meetup. So first part today will be high level overview of underwriting. Hoon is gonna talk about the mindset and tips and the tools. And then the next, and then some uh, discussion of the equity split among partners. And then next, next time we're gonna be doing more deep dive walkthrough uh, on uh, underwriting there. So today will be a little different. So make sure this, just remember this is two parts. Thanks, Yosef. Um, yeah, so like Yosef mentioned, this is gonna be a high level overview. So I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty of underwriting, but more to um, talk about, I guess my thought process and the, the principles that I've, I've learned that I feel uh, have been quite helpful to me to help me process the information and and um, internalize what I've learned and and get given it has given me a lot of clarity as well. Um, so the starting point here with underwriting this talk I'm going to talk about is assuming that I've picked a market now I've, I've chosen a market I'm not going to talk about market analysis too much here but say that you picked a market now a lead comes in in that market what are the steps that I go through? Um, so the first thing that I'd run the deal through is what I call the initial filters. So it's, here are some of the common ones and some of the, the more sensible ones. You have median household income. So for example, a lot of investors don't wanna deal with properties in neighborhoods that have median household income less than a certain number. It could be $30,000, $40,000, $50,000. It depends on the, the investor. Age of the property is another common one. Um, it is common for people to avoid properties that are older than a certain age, say 1960s, 1970s. Uh, flood zone is another thing. Um, a lot of people don't want to deal with properties in the flood zone because you have uh, very high insurance and the risks are just a lot higher when you have a properties in the flood zone. Um, and then you have the different types of assets. You have subsidized housing, student housing, senior living housing. These are different types of assets that some people don't want to deal with, um, but some people um, actually invest exclusively in these asset types. Um, and this dovetails to the next point, which I'm going to make. And that is, um, in my opinion, the reason that these filters exist is because with every single one of these items because is because I think historically investors have found that when you violate one of these filters, you have a property that is very difficult to tackle. And another way to look at it is, is every, for every single one of these items, um, you will have a threshold after which you need to develop a special set of skills to deal with. So for example, if you have an old property, say a building that was built in the 1920s and the 1930s. Now, a lot of people, myself included, I know that when I get into a property like that, everything that I touch is gonna open a can of worms. There's a lot 
it's, it's very difficult to deal with. But I know investors who who like renovating old properties and they have the skill set to do it. They know how to estimate the renovation cost. They know what the pitfalls are, where the snakes in the grass are, and they can they have the skill to deal with these properties very effectively. And and as a result, they get rewarded handsomely for that skill that they have. Uh, another example is subsidized housing. For me, with the level of skills that I have right now, I would not touch a subsidized housing apartment complex that have 100% low income subsidized um, tenants. And there's another 20 years left on the, on the government contract. I, I don't have the skills to do it, but a lot of people do. And as a result, they get rewarded for it. Um, so I guess the point I'm trying to make here is these filters are different for everybody and it depends on the level of skills that you have and also on your risk tolerance as well, how much risk you're willing to tolerate. Um, so that's that's the initial filters. And now say you've run this deal through the initial, the initial filters and it passes. Now, um, what do you do next? So what I do next is I really get into the underwriting and the thing with the underwriting is because there's so much, there's so many things that go into underwriting that I found that it's, it's helpful to, to kind of channel my effort on the things that are, in my opinion, are most important to get the deal, to have to gain a high level of confidence in whether a deal is a good deal or not. And from my underwriting experience, I've learned that I found that these things tend to be, these categories of information tend to be the most critical. So you have the target income, the target expense, the CapEx budget, and the cap rate. Right, so let me expand on these things a little bit. Um, so the target income, this category of information, this is the income that you expect to get from the property after you've taken it over, after you've, you've stabilized it. And you have the most important piece, important piece of information is the target rent. How much rent are you gonna get? And you have the other income, which includes um, utility reimbursement, includes laundry income, fees. And you have the target expense. So this is the expense that you can expect to have when you take the pro uh, take over the property. Uh, so some examples of expenses are, you got tax, insurance, repairs and maintenance, contract services. And then you have the CapEx budget. So this is the money that you need to inject into the project in order to achieve the target income. So it depends on the property. You could have a lot of major deferred maintenance that you need to spend money on. You might have a lot of required interior exterior upgrades that you need to spend money on in order to get the income that you want. Um, so that's the CapEx budget, the money that you need for the rehab. And the last one is cap rate. So this, in my opinion, is probably the hardest thing to get right. It's very difficult to get right. Um, the idea with the cap rate it, is it needs to be able to capture the, the risk and the potential growth of the property and of the, the market. Um, so the cap rate will be different for each market and each sub-market. It needs to reflect the potential growth of that market, the risk of that market, and also the risk of the property itself as well. And it's difficult. It's difficult to get this thing right. Um, and it's, you just need to have a lot of experience with it and know the market well. Um, so I know that these are the four main categories of information that I need to get right. There's a lot more, but these are kind of the main ones I feel like I need to get right. So I, a lot of the effort, the underwriting effort, my underwriting effort will revolve around trying to get these things right. Um, so so let me give you an example, the offering memorandum. So an offering memorandum by a broker will attempt to give you information that would feed all four of these buckets. It will tell you what target income you can expect to get, what the target expense is going to be. Sometimes it will tell you what the CapEx budget uh, will be, if any, um, and it will tell you what cap rates are in this market. Um, what the cap rates are in this market or what cap rates you buy in this property at based on their, their asking price in this market. Now, the main thing that I found with the offering memorandum is the, um, probably the most important thing, what I found is that the ability to separate 
the facts from the assumptions in the offering memorandum. And it's not always straightforward to do so um, because sometimes they mingle the facts and the assumptions. Um, so an example is this, they, they might tell you that, um, say this is a 1985 garden style apartment complex with new roofs that has $200 rent upside. Now, 1985, the age of the property, that's a fact, right? right? New roofs, probably also a fact. The $200 rent upside, that is usually an assumption. And not only is it an assumption, sometimes it means differently depending on the OM and depending on the broker. It could mean that the rent is under market by $200 because of bad management. You can take over the property and you can increase the rent $200 tomorrow. Or it could mean that you need to spend $10,000 per unit to get that grant and you need to spend 18 months to get, to get to that level. So it means differently depending on the OM that you look at. Um, and the cap rate as well. Sometimes they'll tell you that you buy in this property at a 6.5% cap rate based on an, an NOI, the net operating income of $100,000. It could mean that that's the cap rate and the NOI based on the trailing 12 months. So so the actual NOI, it could mean that that's the NOI based on the expense from the last 12 months, but the income from the last oh, three months yeah. annualized, um, which is a common way of doing it because they're saying that that's the expense in the last 12 months, but here's the income in the last three months, which is more reflective of the current performance of the property. And that's, um, that is, is commonly seen as the actual cap rate sometimes, or, it could mean that that's the cap rate that you're going to get. That's the annual OI that you're going to get after you've taken over this property and after you've stabilized the property. Um, so in different OMs, you see the term cap rate used um, differently. And the diff different brokers will use that, will present that information differently. So it's important, important to be able to separate, um, in my opinion, the facts and the assumptions in, in the OM. So another. Another example here is the rent roll and how this interacts with these four categories here. So the rent roll, we only feed information into this bucket here, the income. It doesn't tell you what the target income is gonna be, but it tells you what the current lease rents are and the vacancies. And you can use that to paint the picture and, and, um, and determine what the target income might be, what you might expect to get once you've taken this property over. Now the rent roll, in my opinion, is not as important as the rent comp analysis that you're gonna do yourself. Because the rent comp analysis is gonna give you more meaningful answers in these two buckets here, the target income and the CapEx budget. It'll tell you, because when you do the rent comps, you look at the, the other properties in the area and the different tools to do, to do that. Um, you have apartments.com, you got Automator, um, you talk to the PM, the property manager. But by doing that, you know what you can get on these apartments that you have based on the competition in the area. And this exercise also allows you to understand what the CapEx budget might be. So if you see that all your competitors are getting $200 more, but they have new appliances, they have their units um, look modern, they have new paint, new flooring, then you know that you need to allow for that in your CapEx budget to get, get to that level so you can get the rent um, that you want. So this, this rent comp analysis is, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important tasks that you do um, in the underwriting uh, process. And another task that you do is reviewing the financials. So the financials are usually in the form of the trailing 12 months. So that's the income and expense in the last 12 months. And that will give you information to help you determine the income, the target income and target expense. Now, usually it's in the past 12 months, it won't tell you, it won't tell you what you're gonna get um, when you take the property over, but it can give you information to predict what you can expect to get. And if it's a stabilized property, it's a turnkey stabilized property, then what, um, you have in the financials are going, going to be very similar to the income and the expense that you are going to get um, when you take the property over because it's already stabilized. Now, the financials can sometimes 
give you information. And I drew this as a dotted line here because sometimes it can give you glimpses into the CapEx budget that you might have. So for example, you're looking through the financials, you're looking through the T12, you see a line item there for, for what expense that, that's really high and doesn't make sense. You see, you know that there's something about plumbing that you might need to spend money on. There might be a leak in there, so you might have to allow for a budget to fix the pipes, for example, right? Um, so that's so that's the financials. Um, one thing that I want to point out with the financials is it's okay to put the financials, the different line items in the in the T12 into your own buckets that are consistent across the different projects that you look into. So for example, if the pest control is under the contract services bucket for you, then you can just reorganize that when you review the T12 and move them into the bucket so you can have, you have consistency across the deals that you look at. Um, so that's the financials. What else um, do we have here? So the sale comp analysis. Now, the cap rate, this last, this last piece of information here, this is difficult to get, get right. And one way to get information to fit that bucket is to do a sale comp analysis, um, which is not always easy to do because it's hard to get sale comps. You have, you can have a property, you get a co-star report and there'll be some sale comps in there, but it's hard to get something that's similar to your property in the same neighborhood, kind of similar construction, similar age. And sometimes you get something that's similar, but it was sold say 18 months ago, two years ago, and the market has moved a lot since then. So it's hard to get something that's reflective of, of the current market condition a lot of the time. Um, so that, but that, so that's a cap right there. Um, now I've talked about the task and the documents that you reveal, but there are also the people that will help you get the information um, for these categories as well. So for example, the property manager, a good property manager in your market should be able to tell you what the type of income might be. So if you have a property, you bring it to your property manager, a good property manager in the area, he should be able to tell you what rent you can expect to get in this, in this market for, for this property. Um, and if you spend this much money on the rehab, um, say $5,000 a unit, to get to this level, you can expect to get this type of rent. And then they can tell you, you know, with this mark, this property that you have, um, the age of the property, the construction of the property, the neighborhood that it's in, you can expect to spend this amount of money per unit per year, say $5,000 a unit, $4,000 a unit a year. And they, a, good, a good PM will have all that information for you with a relatively high degree of confidence in a relatively relatively short amount of time. So this guy is really valuable because you can get all that information, the really important information here in a short period of time. You can talk to another broker to try to get information on the cap rate. Again, very difficult to get this cap rate right. If you know how a contractor or you have connection to a contractor, you can use use that lead relationship um, leverage that relationship to get information on the capex so you can tell them here's what you want to do with the property and the contractor might be able to help you um, get some information on the on the capex budget so you have the information that you reveal the tasks that you do and the people that can help you get information on these um, what i believe are the four really important categories of information here Um, and to highlight, to highlight that, I just want to give you a quick numerical example here. So say if you have an apartment complex that has 50 units, you know that by talking to the PM from your local knowledge, you know that you're going to get $10,000 in income from this unit, from the rent and from the, from the utility reimbursement. So that's $500,000 a year for 50 units. Now, the PM told you that with this property you have, you can expect to spend about $4,500 a unit in expenses. Now that's $225,000 a year. And in order to get this rent, you know that 
you need to spend five thousand dollars per unit on interior. It could be new paint, new flooring, maybe some new appliances, and you have some exterior upgrades that you have to do, and that will cost you hundred thousand dollars, for example. You know, there's some um, say there's uh, a driveway that you have to fix. That maybe there's a pool that you have to fix. Some exterior painting you have to do. So three hundred fifty thousand dollars total in capex budget that you can expect to spend on this property to get the performance that you want, the target income here. Now the cap rate from your local knowledge, from talking to the broker, other brokers, um, from reviewing the sale comps, you think that this is a six and a half percent cap rate. That's what you can get when you, um, that's what the market cap rate is for this property. Now, with that information, is $3 million a good price? It would be a good price because let me just, actually let me just quickly do um, do the calculation here to show you how, essentially what I meant. Um, so I have this property here, 500K in income, 225K in target expense. So the NOI is 275,000. Now with the cap rate of 6.5%, I know that once I've stabilized this property, this thing is gonna be worth, because of the cap rate, it's going to be worth $4.23 million. Now, if I buy this thing at $3 million, right, there's going to be acquisition fees, going to be closing costs. So say another, add another 5% on top of that. So that's 3.15 million. And I have to spend here $350,000 on rehab. So add that to that. So now I'm, all in at approximately $3.5 million. And I have a property that's worth 4.25 million. Now, if I divide that by the value of the property, that's about 80%. So I know that this project, by the end of it, once I've stabilized this property, I'm gonna build 20% equity in it. And that, that's a good deal. I mean, that's objectively a good deal in my opinion. I mean, I don't know what, I mean, I haven't really looked into the cash on cash returns, the, the loan structure, but just from the information that we have here in these four main categories, I kind of know that this is a good deal here um, without even knowing the exact, you know, cash on cash returns and all those other things. Um, but then obviously there's a lot more that you had to do, right, in, in the writing. Let me share my screen. Uh, let me maximize this again. Um, so there's a lot of other things that goes into underwriting, and this is where you use a deal analyzer, um, a spreadsheet software to analyze the deal. I use um, Synthesis by Chris Jackson. And with the deal analyzer, you're gonna take the information from what I believe are the more important categories here, feed the information into the deal analyzer, but you also have these other things here to complete the picture. Just these are just some of them, it's not everything here, but you have the loan, gotta get the loan structure right. Um, feed that into the analyzer, equity split, which we're gonna talk about briefly. Uh, the reserves, so that could be the operating reserves, that the debt reserves, other costs and fees. So that's, you know, acquisition cost, um, acquisition fees and, and asset management fees, refi and exit timeframe, future projections of the profits and loss. So you feed all, all that information into the deal analyzer, but my focus is still usually to try to get these four things right first. Um, so let me just quickly go through the deal analyzer that I use. Um, now this is synthesis. Now this, going through this thing would be another two hour um, presentations. I'm not gonna go through everything, but I just wanna use this. So this is the same example that we had before. So this is the, the 50 unit with, you know, you can buy $60,000 a unit, $3 million. Oh, and can you um, go as, as big as you can with that and still be able to Sure. Well, let me move this out of the way. Thank you. So this is the same example that I had before, $3 million for 50 units. Now, let me go back to this here. 
So I'm going to try to get these four things right first in the analyzer, right? So the target income, that is in the, um, so I know that I can get $840 here in rent and the current rent is about $700. So I try to get the target income right first by getting the rents right, getting the, the utility reimbursement right and the other income, the fees right, if appropriate. So now I get to this point where I know that this is, going to get me $500,000 in income. So that's the first thing that I need to get right. And then I'll try to get the expense right. So in this case, $4,500. So that's $275,000 annually for, for the whole apartment complex. So that's the income and expense. Now, the third thing that I'll try to get right is the, the CapEx. So $350,000 in this case. And then finally, I try to get the... Um, the cap rates right in this case six and a half cap when i refi based on the information that i have i think that when i refi this thing i can get six and a half cap um and then when i sell this it's, it's going to be seven cap again these things are difficult to get right um and i do that and then obviously there's a lot more things that you have to input we have the loan structure here you got the um the acquisition fee asset management the reserves all the other things that you got to get right but once you get these four things right, you can know objectively whether a deal is a good deal or not. And I just want to highlight that by talking about this thing down here. This is the, the loan structure real quick here. So in this example, I have um, a loan structure with the community bank, 25% down payment for 0.25% interest rate. 24 months I.O., 25 years amortization, 75% rehab by the banks. The bank's going to pay for 75% of the rehab cost. And with all the input that I have, this deal is returning 16.85%, so 87% IRR at the project level. So this is a really good deal. Now, what if my, um, what if my interest rate it's only 4%, now the returns are higher, 17%. But if it's 5%, returns are 15%. But if it's 7%, now so the returns aren't good anymore, you're getting 12%. But it's not because the deal is not a good deal. You look at the performance down here, but the deal is still a good deal. I just need to find better finance. So by getting these four things right, I know that this is a good deal. But I still need to complete the picture here. But in this case here, I have really bad returns, but it's not because the deal is a, a bad deal. It's just, I need to talk to people. I need to connect with people to get better in a uh, better loan. Um, so I just want to use this to highlight, highlight that point that I was trying to make. Um, let me go back to, oh, with this deal analyzer, another thing that I want to talk about is, um, I guess some, some challenges that I had when I first started, and these are some of the things that were quite difficult for me to wrap my head around when I first started underwriting. And I just want to touch on them really quickly in case you run into the same issue if you're starting out. I know a lot of you guys are a lot more experienced. But the first thing is the, the modeling of rent increase and loss to lease. So there are two ways that people do it. Some people just model the rent as lease rent that gets increased over the years. So if you rehab, you're doing a lot of renovation in the first year, the year one and year two, you just increase the, re the rent by 10% in year one, maybe another 10% in year two, and then it becomes just organic rent growth of three or 2% after that. So that's one way of doing it. The second way to do it is model the rent increase with just the market rent increasing at the organic rent growth rate in the market to 2% for example, 3%. But then you model the loss to lease that starts with a really high number in year one because your rent is really below market. And then you burn off this loss to lease to get to a, um, a rent that is closer to market rent. So there's two ways of doing it. And it, I found it, it, was, it confused me a little bit when I first started. So I guess if you're starting out, just be aware that two ways that people would do it. Um, and there's no, uh, no right or wrong way. Um, 
or what else? Uh, oh, the second thing is modeling the interaction between vacancy and your renovation plan. So for example, if you plan to um, renovate 50% of your unit in, um, in a year, and you're only modeling 6% vacancy, physical vacancy, it's impossible for you to model. To, and it's like if each turn takes you two months, it's impossible for you to achieve 50% uh, unit turns with just 6% vacancy. And the way to do that is to, to model out the rent turns. In synthesis, you can do that with, as a, I think there's a spreadsheet, there's a sheet here that allows you to do that. Um, so, and then the, what else? Um, loan assumption is another thing that can be tricky if you're only starting out. Um, and the key thing with loan assumption is you need to get, you need to make sure that the, the three things that you need to make sure, you need to make sure that your loan balance is the same amount as the outstanding principal on the loan that you're assuming. You need to make sure that you, you're paying off this debt at the same time as in the loan in the loan assumption. And the third thing is you need to make sure that you you model accurately the um, the loan payment, the annual loan payment or the monthly loan payment. And you do that by uh, depend on I guess depend on the analyzer, but you would do that by manipulating the down payment to get the principal right and manipulating the uh, the amortization period here and also the interest rate to get your, your loan payment right and your, um, your, your time that it takes for you to get out of the debt right. Um, so that's that's the deal analyzer. Let me move, go back to the, the presentation here. But one last thing I want to talk about, I want to touch on in terms of underwriting is, is stress testing. So stress testing, this is when you, you play with a different input to see how it affects the result. And I have found that this, this has helped me a lot um, in two things, sorry, three things. Um, the first thing is it helps me consider the risks that are sometimes difficult to quantify or estimate in the underwriting. So for example, Say if I'm looking at a property that's in kind of a, a rough neighborhood, and um, I mean, if the, the economy goes down next year, I feel like this can be hit really badly. I can have really high vacancy. I mean, ideally, all those, all those risks are captured in the cap rate, but if I feel that the cap rate is not properly capturing the risk that I'm worrying about, I'm, I'm worried about then, I will go through the stress testing exercise here so I could change the target income you know, the, by, by changing the vacancy in year two and year three and see how it affects the deal. Um, so that's reason number one. Reason number two for me is it, it helps me understand my risk tolerance. So for example, if, if I think that I can refire this thing at six and a half cap, but, um, but if the cap rate becomes seven and a half cap when I refire this thing. I'm not going to make any money. I'm going to lose money. Then am I going to be okay with that? And the answer might be yes, because if that happens, then you know a lot of people are also losing money. So maybe, maybe I'm okay with that. Um, so that's reason number two. And reason number three for me is it, it helps me allocate the effort, the underwriting effort properly between the, the different um, categories of information here. So say if I find that I spend hours, you know, an hour trying to decipher a T12, try to get the target expense right within, you know, is it $4,500, is it $4,600, but only spend like two minutes on my rent, um, rent comp analysis and the performance of the deal is really sensitive to the, the rent, the target rent, then I, I need to spend more time here. Um, so that's, that's stress testing. Um, so yeah, so um, so I guess with underwriting, there's a lot of information that goes into it. And I found that um, trying to focus on the things that are more important because you're not gonna have the same amount of time every time you underwrite a deal. Um, has helped me a lot with processing the information. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about just briefly is, is equity split. And Joseph and Nico are gonna go into the details here. But I just want to 
I just want to give you my perspective based on what I've seen and based on what I've learned. So when you have a deal, there's two things that need to happen that need to happen for a deal to happen. You need to put in the effort to do it, and you need to take financial risk for that deal to happen. And from what I've seen, in order to have a fair split, the equity given to the effort pool needs to be worth the effort and the return given to the, the risk pool needs to be worth the risk. So, and it's different. So that's why the equity split is gonna be different for each deal. So for example, you have say a JV deal um, between two partners, one partner puts in all the money, for example, um, and he still has to do some work because in a JV deal, everybody has to participate. Everybody has to have, um, have a say in it, have control of the, of the deal. Um, but there's one partner who puts in all the money, but he gets 70% of the equity. Now, the annualized return on this deal at the project level is 20%. For the guy that puts in all the money but gets 70% split, now his annualized return is going to be 70% 70 of the 20%, so that's 14%. He can look at that and say, I can get 14% here because of the equity split, or I can invest in a, a syndication, a low risk syndication with an experienced um, syndicator and get 16%, for example, annualized, annualized return here. And there's no effort, he doesn't have to do any work. And he, um, his risk is limited to the amount of money that he invests, whereas in a JV, if he signs on a loan, he, you know, the things go sideways, he's on the hook for a lot more. So he looked at that and say, this split doesn't make sense for me because the return is not worth the risk that I'm taking. Same thing with the effort. Another example is say you have, um, say a, uh, a duplex that requires $50,000 down payment, but it's a, it's a, high, um, it's a, it's a high return deal, have heavy lift deal, now, one partner puts in all the money, the $50,000. The other partner does a lot of work. He does, he does most of the work. He finds the deal. He, um, he spends six hours a day, every day at the property for three months, for example. Now, is a 50-50 split fair? I guess it would be fair because even though he's not putting in any money, he's there every day, six hours a day for, 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 uh, for three months. That's a lot of time that he's investing in the, in the deal. So his effort, in this case, 50, 50 split is his effort is worth fifty thousand dollars, same amount of money as that the other guy is putting in. But if this was the deal that was ten times as big, say it was you need to put in five hundred thousand dollars. Now, the effort partner is still putting in the same amount of work. He's still there every day for, for three months. But now maybe he doesn't need to get 50 percent uh, split anymore. Maybe he of uh, twenty. 80% split is, is more appropriate because it's, this is now a much bigger deal and the 20% split is worth his effort. Um, and the same concept of, of the same, the same two concepts here, I think apply to, to, um, to syndication deals as well, in my opinion, because in the syndication deal, you have the sponsors and you have the LP. So the sponsors are putting a lot of effort here and we're also taking a lot of financial risk as well, because they have to put up a lot of money upfront for um, earnest money deposit and also you know due diligence. They have to spend all that money. The LPs, the limited partners, um, only take financial risk and it's limited to the amount of money that they invest in. And the splits will be dependent on obviously how good a deal is, um, how much effort sponsors will have to, to put in the deal and the level of experience of the, of the sponsor, the effort, right? So if this, you have a deal where there's a lot of work and the sponsors are good because they put a lot of effort into becoming good and to, to work on the deal, then maybe uh, they need to get more of the, of the split and vice versa. Well, within the sponsors, are these same two concepts do you apply, I think. Within the sponsors, you have you have the deal finder, you have the money raiser, you have the asset managers. So these guys do a lot of work here. 
the deal finder finds the deal, the money raiser has to raise the money, and you're the asset manager doing asset management. And you have the other team members within the sponsor group that um, take a lot more financial risk. So you have risk capital. So this is the guy that puts up money for uh, earn some money deposit or, or, or due diligence. And you got the loan guarantor. So a lot of time, nothing happens. Um, he doesn't have to do much, but if things go sideways, then he's, he's most exposed. He's on the hook for everything. And it's not just one person. It could be, it could be a group, like the, each of these items um, would be a group. It's not just one person. It's not necessarily one person. Now, the equity split between the sponsors will also be dependent on the deal. So if you have an amazing deal, then maybe the deal finder needs to get a higher split because it takes a lot of effort for him to find that deal. He would have to underwrite 100 deals, have, he would have to talk to 100 owners in order to find that deal. So maybe he needs to get a higher split. And maybe the money raiser, because it's such an amazing deal that people queue up to invest in it, maybe he doesn't need to get as high of a split. And vice versa, if it's, a, if it's just a turnkey stabilized deal, then you need to put a lot of work into raising the money, maybe maybe the money raiser needs to get a higher split and the deal finder doesn't get as high of a, of a split because it's, it's, not, um, it's not as difficult to find that deal. Same thing with the asset manager. If it's a heavy lift deal, maybe he needs to get a higher split because it's a lot of work um, and you know, risk capital. If it's a deal that, if it's perceived that there's a lot of things that can go wrong between, between uh, getting the deal under contract and closing it, then maybe, maybe this guy needs to get a higher split. The loan guarantor, if it's perceived that this is a high risk project, if there's things that can go wrong with this property, then maybe he needs to get a higher split. Um, so it's different, again, it's different. Uh, like Yosef said earlier, it's different for each deal. There's no magic split number that you can apply for every deal. Um, yeah, so that, that's it guys. I mean, these are the things, I guess these are the, the principles that I've, I've learned and internalized because there's so much with underwriting, there's so much, um, there's so many things that go into underwriting. So I feel like these, these things have helped me um, process the information a little easier as the information comes in um, because there's so many ways of doing equity splits and so, so many things that you have to consider in underwriting. So having these principles, um, they, they, they helped me a little bit with processing the, the information. Um, so hopefully, yeah, it's, you might find some of these uh, helpful as well. All right. Uh, yeah, but uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. Okay, we could you could stop screen sharing, Hun. Uh, and right. thank you, thank you very much. There was a there was a great walkthrough of the thought process for the underwriting. I, I thought that was great, and also the explanation of what is split based on the, we call it sweat equity, right? Sweat and, and money. That's also great too. Again, uh, there's no hard and fast rule that, oh, in case you're gonna get only 5% or 10% or as opposed to 20%. Uh, I've done couple uh, and it was all different. Like Hun said, the deal and how many partners are in it and what kind of role that we're taking up. Um, and Nico has a good example, exemplary spreadsheet that we could show you uh, how we do it. Like, again, there's no hard and fast rules. This is like, you know, general can use this spreadsheet certain numbers. Uh, can you kind of briefly walk through Nico? Yeah. All right, guys. So there's a bunch of these calculators out there. Uh, the equity split calculators, you make them on a spreadsheet. Uh, people, you could do your own. You can just use what Hoon told you the different categories, right? Sourcing, contracting, DD and closing, risk capital, money raiser, balance sheet guarantor, asset management. I have a few of these and I can, I'm going to send you, I'm going to see uh, which one we should send you guys after along with the follow-up email with this recording. So you'll have one, uh, but here's a quick example. Now this one comes from Vince Gethings, who's one of our coaches. Uh, and this, this percentage is not his, this is something that I adjusted. So how much do you think should go to sourcing on the people on your team? 20%, 30%, 5%. There's a lot that goes into it. Just your thought process. Okay. How much should go into the risk capital? If you went hard with your money day one, you might want to put in more percentage here. 
if you don't go hard and there's a not there's not a great chance of losing your capital, then maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you reduce this a little bit. For the money raiser, like Kuhn was talking about, if it's a difficult raise, you want to bring this up to 20% maybe, but all, you know, your, your thought process. The guarantor, if it's a non-recourse loan, maybe you don't give them as much. Maybe, maybe if it's a recourse loan, you got to really bump that up. Uh, asset management, how much asset management do you think is going to be happening and how much should be given for that job? Now, within these categories, we, we go down and you, not everybody, not one person has sourced the deal. Maybe three people worked on the due diligence. One person found the deal. One person negotiated. Somebody did all the due diligence, right? So you're going to split this up amongst your team members. This particular calculator gives you six spaces, okay? You can add spaces and obviously reduce spaces. Uh, risk capital. Maybe two of you guys put in the risk capital. So you're splitting that, right? This is really a partnership between two people. We did 50-50 here each, every, all the way down, just to give you an example. Who raised the money? You guys raised an equal amount of money, but it makes sense. You guys are getting paid for what you're doing here, right? You're getting a little bit of a of percentage of equity for what you're putting into it. Who brought the balance sheet? Maybe I am. I don't have enough money to show my balance sheet, but my partner does, so he could he or she could bring 100% of that. And then the asset management. So it's very basic. Fill it out, and you're going to come up with you know a where is it? I guess the overall here would be the overall percentage of, of your GP. Right, so now this is a this is a, an example for a syndication. So it's 30 percent, 30 70 split. Managers are getting 30 percent. Here is your 30 percent. You guys are getting 15 percent of the total overall deal each. If this is a partnership of two people controlling this syndication, uh-huh. they each did exactly the same work. 50 percent, 50 percent. They're getting 15 percent. If there are six people, this is going to obviously change. Uh-huh. Right. So and. Don't forget, D, can, can you scroll up a little bit? So as you can see, this 100% for the managers are uh, 30% of overall equity and 100% from that. So that's not literally 100% of equity, right? And then below that, the breakdown, even the breakdown, when we say the 100% is 100% of the breakdown of the 30%. So you got to have some certain layers when you think about that. and then. Here, it was just two partners, but as Nico said, we could have three, four, five, six. This is uh, this is made for six partners, but if you need more than that, you could kind of add the lines. Um, you can ask whoever is good at spreadsheet, creating spreadsheet, and simply they could just add another lines for uh, more partners. Yeah, so the, it'll be here. We'll send you guys one. Uh, feel free to, what I would just adjust to these numbers based on what your team thinks. Talk about it with the team prior to closing the deal, like way prior. You don't want to get caught in this. Uh, well, you have to anyway for legal documents, but do this as early as possible. Mm-hmm. Figure out which percentage is going to go to what and then go after what you think you can handle most. Right. And, and George George was asking, is there any standard equity split? There, there is no standard. As we said, there's no hard and fast rules. This is based on purely how much you can, how much you think it would be fair for yourself, but not only yourself, for other, other uh, partners, and also how much you can agree to. So for example, I see here is, it's, uh, it's 30 and 70. I also saw 20, 80, right? So uh, it could be 28. Hmm? We oh, are sorry. doing uh, protocols. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it could be 80, 20, uh, 30, 70. Depends on the, the experience of the, um, uh, the, the managers. Uh, they might claim for more, claim for a little less. But again, that's what's agreeable. So if, even if it's 30 and 70, if the deals is still good for the, for the members, if the return is still good, you know, uh, the members shouldn't have any problem. Right, and sometimes the managers will lower it to twenty percent just to make uh, the make the deal look better for members, so that you could attract more investors in the deal. And then, uh, for example, for the sourcing, finding the deal, I've seen um, for the one who found the deal, I see the sponsor group yielding uh, somewhere from five to fifteen percent of GP share. Uh, risk capital, I've seen about 25% to 35% of the GP share. And money raiser, I've seen 5 to 10% for uh, somewhere from somewhere from 300 to a million in between. 
and go. It depends on the relationship. They may give you a little more. They may give you a little less. Uh, balance sheet guarantor. I've seen, again, this is not hard and fast. I'm just giving you uh, the ones that I saw. Balance sheet guarantor, I've seen 1% to 2% to uh, 3 to 5%. Um, asset management, I've seen 25% to 35%. Uh, again, this is all adjustable. Uh, so that's what I've seen. Is there anyone uh, have different numbers that you saw? Like Nico, do you have anything else? No. Well, yeah, you gave great ranges. I just want to add in though, that when we see this, once we get this overall percentage of ownership, right, for the GP, we can take these numbers and we can plug it into synthesis. Synthesis has like a different, a different area where you could, so then you can see how much return you would be getting on a project. Like you're going to take, because there's a, a partnership split uh, in this synthesis analyzer. And a lot of analyzers have them too. And you'll put in, so like this would be uh, Yosef, this would be Hoon, this would be me, right? And I would have like 20%. I would take that and punch it into my, it, where I'm I'm also labeled in synthesis, just to see what I would be earning, you know, in year over year and monthly even. Right. And then after you're doing that, sometimes you know, partners can talk again. Okay, I thought this will be a little more or less. Um, I think it's fair to give you a little more because you're going to be doing the boots on the ground. You're going to be the boots on the ground and you're going to be uh, being a point contact person in locally. So I want you to get a little more. You know, that's that's why I think uh, it's important to be in a team where partners all understand each other and try to be fair to each other. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's 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 get some questions, right? Mm-hmm. Gonna, um, you, you can you can unmute yourself and uh, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask or share your view on equity split. I mean, I know a couple of you are already in a deal, so you must have done uh, this part already. So uh, I want you guys to share too. This is open discussion. All right, questions on underwriting, questions on partnership structure. Don't be weird. Don't be. Don't feel uncomfortable. Ask any questions. It doesn't have to be a basic question. It could be an in-depth question. Any kind of question. For example, here a question could be like, "Well, I've seen people underwrite with a six point five cap rate, but the cap rate changes when they're putting it in the sale. Why does it change?" Boom. Jeff, I've got a question. question. Um, yeah, oh, so you know. Uh, a lot of folks, they, they want to underwrite conservatively, um, especially given where we are in the market. You know, I've seen in terms of rent growth, um, what do you typically use uh, for rent growth assumptions um, outside of like the initial increase from, you know, current in-place rents to the renovation rents? Like going forward, do you use 2%, 5%? Um, you know, have, what are your thoughts there? Um, I think it would be very much dependent on the market that you're in. Um, if you're in a hard market, one would argue even in a hot, uh, sorry, a hot low cap market, one would argue that because the reason that the cap rates are low in that market is because people are expecting a lot of growth in that market, a lot of rent growth in that market. So you would expect to have to see higher annual organic rent growth in a market with a lower cap. That's to compensate for the, the, the lower return that you're getting in the early years. Um, so that, that's what I normally say, but it could be, it could be 2%, could be 3 4 5%. It really depends on the market. And also, this is a good thing to stress test as well, because it's extremely difficult to predict. Nobody, nobody can get it right. You know? you, we can only guess what's going to be. Um, so this is a good thing that the annual grant increase something that's is a good thing to use a stress test in your underwriting. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Okay, Andy. Uh, hey, how are you guys? Um, uh, so on our first deal, um, if we, you know, if we're uh, out there like searching for sponsors and, and, um, um, our financial risk, of course, you know, with the sponsor mostly. Um, and what what kind of offer can we offer those sponsors? Uh, uh, can there be like four sponsors like in, in one deal like that to help, 
with the um, a deal or how, how does that like uh, what, what is the best way to kind of you know talk to a sponsor or or like give them the best deal where it can benefit uh, you know both parties are you are you asking if if how, what's the best way to become a co-sponsor co with a main sponsor i'm sorry i kind of didn't no no i mean like you know if it's our first deal right and okay. if we're looking for like a sponsor to sponsor our deal um you know and is there is there a way to kind of like in talk to them or is there a way to offer to them a, in a, 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 um like you know are they is there a criteria for those sponsors to sponsor us or like how can we offer them the best uh, okay. deal for, oh, you know what I mean? So when, when you say uh, your first deal, you mean when you find a deal, you want to work with yeah. a sponsor? Yeah. Yes. Un right. Understand. understand. Exactly. I see. Exactly. I see. Exactly. Uh, so again, I, I think it, it depends on the relationship between you and the sponsor. Mm -hmm. um, usually sponsors are the ones who with, with the experience, with, with the net worth, and it could bring uh, all the rest other than the finding the deal because you just found a deal, right? Right, right, right. So to them, basic, basically, uh, just and if anyone correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, it is more like you're actually handing over, you could be handing over the deal to them. Uh -huh. And then because you found a deal, uh, you, you can ask for a general partnership share, right? Oh, okay. Again, I will say about maybe ten percent or fifteen percent or more. Mm -hmm. I mean, depends on the uh, depends on the relationship and, and how far they want to go. And then, okay. if you, if this is your first deal, what I will do is I will gladly join uh, with the team and more experienced mm -hmm. investors. Obviously, you're gonna have to vet them. Yeah, and then you know learn from them, right? Right. Let them take care from the beginning to the end, and. Mm -hmm. uh, but work with them, learn from them, learn mm -hmm. uh, how they manage the deal and also learn, be part of the asset management team and mm -hmm. also learn from them as a, as a co-GP. Okay. That's one so way. Another way is you could probably uh, bring in other partners, like someone who's more experienced, but not necessarily like sponsoring your deal. You could mm -hmm. kind of put the team together Let's mm -hmm. say bring in one experienced investors, bring another high net worth individual, bring in someone else to raise the capital. Like, like it's like a creating your own team, but it will right. be harder because you're going to have to find and vet a lot more, uh, many different partners. Okay. And then share the, uh, share the GP share among yourselves. So right. I'll say there could be a two ways. It's just, just building mainly. Um, so one, no one way is you know building building your your own team um with uh experience you know experience um investors or experience uh people and the other way is finding a sponsor that has the high net worth to kind of like partner with you and be the the co um you know the the the, the co-person or the co-sponsor Right, but in, in that in that way, you're gonna be pretty much handing over your deal to to them, right? right? right. And then just be so, part so, of it. But so again, you can learn acquisition, right? Right, and you can like learn. You, you can get some acquisition fee. You can get some uh -huh. GP share. But you can learn mm -hmm. a lot from them. But again, the other but way, is that, is, you think that mm -hmm. is like a, is it? You think that is like the best way to approach this, uh, approach it for for a beginner or. I, I wouldn't say best way, but I would say easier Wait, okay, cool. than easier, creating right? your own team because the, the starting of creating your own team shouldn't start when you find a deal. You, you're supposed to start networking now and yeah. then start creating your own team, talking to a lot of right. people. If right. I have a deal in this market, would you be willing to, you know, I mean, I'm just giving you yeah, yeah. an example. Yeah. And then when you get a deal, that's when you can bring the deal to other potential oh, partners. But that will take a lot more time and energy for you. Right, right, right. Understood. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question about underwriting or target the, um, the market rent. 
uh, I think I spend so much time to um, to find to find what is uh, the rent it is. Um, for example, like uh, I go to the apartments.com to see the uh, nearby or comps apartment and really looking into the amendment and if it is renovated or not renovated and kind of cla classify if it is like the same class C or class B. Um, is that uh, is that what you uh, do, or do you do you have any suggestion like how much time you spend to find the target rent or market rent, um, and how much time you kind of communicate with the property management and rely on their d data? Um, yeah, so you can spend a lot of time on the rent comp analysis, um, especially if it's a new market and it's a market that you haven't invested in right. um, because it's very easy to spend hours on it to get the accurate and it's, it's not easy to get the right comps if you're not in the market you have to look at them if say for example if you have an apartment complex with three different uh unit types like three bed two bath uh no, two bed one bath one bed one bath then ideally for each of those unit types you need to find comps associated with them um, and it can take a lot of time, especially if you're just combing through, you're going through the, the data from apartments.com um, and from Rentometer. Um, so I would say that you need to probably, you need to assign, if it's, if it's a market that you have already picked, you probably need to assign a significant amount of effort on building the relationship with the PM because they will get you that information a lot quicker and with a higher level of confidence, you can spend you know, an hour, two hours to look at apartments.com and Tometer. Or if you ha already have a PM, you can just ask them and they'll tell you. And that usually more, you know, if it's a good PM, if the information is more accurate than the information that you get online. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, establish a good relationship, but that's more important. And is yeah, that's a good tip. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't we all struggle with that? And there's some, like, to, if you're gonna, there's no quick solution to it except for calling the property manager. So, great question. We all do that. Like, we'll, like Hoon was saying, we use Rentometer also. We also use apartments.com. We use CoStar reports. But to get an answer quick and get an offer in, you're gonna want to talk to PM, and they're definitely more accurate than I can be. So, awesome. All right, let's, uh, and no more questions. We can wrap it up. What do you think, Yos? Yeah, I think it was a great session. And uh, again, thank you very much, Hoon. Uh, also, I really don't really, I, I really don't, I really don't see uh, people talk about equity split. So it was actually my first time openly having some uh, discussion to this extent with people. Um, so it was, uh, it was great. Uh, it was great discussion. I mean, this is something that we all are interested in to know, but we don't really talk uh, openly, right? So it was good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, uh, Nico will send out this spreadsheet sample. I mean, no way, uh, it's by no means, it's the only way. So try to play with it, trying to like play uh, with the spreadsheet and think, okay, how much I could take as a, you know, Dill finder, how much I could probably yield as as uh as for the asset management, and then ask your partners or ask other people around you what is their comfort level, and how far they can go with it. That that way you can kind of see uh, what range you will expect uh, for the next deal. Yeah, it's a tough conversation to have, but it's really really important, and you want to have it as early as possible when you're building and talking to a team. Mm -hmm. Guys, uh, thank you all for being I here. Agree. Uh, for, for those of you who are still on, it's important to know that we're all, we all, none of us here are perfect at underwriting, even the best underwriter on planet Earth in the universe. Is, we're always here to learn. So all questions are excellent questions. I'm happy that you guys were willing to open up a little bit. Next session too, open up as much as you can, even if you have no idea, if your head is spinning and you have no idea what's going on and you think that we might have covered something and you don't want to sound silly, just ask the question. We got to get over that. We got to be open. Okay. Mm -hmm. 100%, 100%. All right. 
That being said, thank you very much for coming. And we were Nico and Yosef, and we're going to see you again in a month. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank that you. was a lot of fun. Thank Thanks you. again for having me, Yosef and Nico. Thanks, guys.